Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Better Together or Apart. A breakaway advisor shares why he and his team chose separate paths. It's a conversation with Dan Johnson, President and CEO of Birch Creek Wealth Management. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. For Apple Podcast users, I'd be grateful if you'd give the show a review. Your input helps us to make the series better and alerts other advisors like you who may find the content to be relevant. And while you're at it, if you know others who are considering change or are simply looking to learn more about the industry landscape, please feel free to share this episode or series widely. There's real value to building teams in wealth management firms. For clients and the business overall, there's strength in numbers, where the merging of talent offers the potential of greater operational efficiencies and growth. Plus, teams provide a built-in succession plan, keeping the business in-house should any of the advisors on the team desire to retire. Yet many of these teams were formed not by the intentional coming together of like-minded players, but instead more at the encouragement of the firm to join forces a retention strategy of sorts, because being part of a team makes it more difficult to leave the firm. Yet it doesn't always work out that way. While these team members may have developed efficient and amicable practices together, the individuals never fully realize the synergies typical of a successful ensemble. That is, as my guest on this episode put it, they operate more like a bowling team than a basketball team. Dan Johnson saw real value in being part of a multi-generational team at Merrill. As the youngest member of the group, he credits each of his partners for the knowledge he gained over his eight-year tenure, and he felt a real camaraderie existed, but there was still something missing. Yet there was one thing they were all aligned upon, their frustrations over changes at Merrill. So as a group, they decided to explore their options. And it was through due diligence that it became apparent they each had different visions, goals, and timelines, which ultimately led them each to consider different options. That is, while Dan's interests were leaning towards independence, his partners were looking at other employee models. It's a common story we're hearing from advisors in recent years. Team members coming to a fork in the road where they need to honestly answer the threshold question, are we better together? or apart. And in this case, the team decided to go their separate ways, with Dan choosing independence, three of his partners opting to go to Morgan Stanley, and one signing on to Merrill's Sunset Program, CTP. So in August of 2019, Dan launched RIA firm Birch Creek Wealth Management based in Dayton, Ohio. In this episode, Dan speaks candidly about that decision-making process and why he felt independence was the best path for his business and his goals. He talks about thinking through the pros and cons of each option they considered, particularly what it meant to give up moving with his team, but also the upfront cash that was a part of it. He shares his thoughts on CTP and why he didn't choose to stay with his partner and become the inheritor of his book and why he ultimately made the leap to independence on his own, leaving some assets behind with a strategic intent to shrink to grow, and where his business is at today. So let's get to it. Dan, welcome to the show. I'm so grateful you're here. Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure. So I want to dive in and hear a little bit about your path to Merrill Lynch, but yours is an unusual story or a good story to highlight because it's about a team that you joined that you eventually split from because you and the partners 
had different visions for the future. So I want to get to that, but let's first start with your background and the path that led you to Merrill. Sure. Happy to share. And thank you so much for having me. So I graduated from the University of Florida with a degree in business finance, which led me to taking a role at T. Rowe Price, a large no-load mutual fund family out of their Tampa, Florida office. And that role was an inbound sales role in the call center. And that was 2007. So flash forward, I didn't want to be taking service requests all day. So I studied in the evenings for uh, my series seven and 66 and Again, went to a sales role there in taking inbound phone calls from 401k participants. And this led to the, obviously the Great Recession, 2008 and 2009. So what I felt would be a, an inside sales role turned into being a, a psychologist of sorts, right? Walking people back from the ledge while they're watching their retirement savings uh, that they've scrimped and saved for all their lives evaporate before them. Here I am fresh out of college giving the, these folks uh, financial advice. And it was really uh, being thrown to the wolves on the job training for what's ultimately been a foundational approach to my career, which is managing risk on the downside for folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you were with Merrill for eight years and part of a five person team. So first and foremost, what went into the decision to join a team as opposed to working as a solo advisor when you joined? Sure. So I moved back to the Dayton, Ohio area with my high school sweetheart and uh, took the position with Merrill. And I actually interned uh, for Merrill while I was at uh, the University of Florida. So I was familiar with the company, had a lot of respects, really viewed them as uh, the Yankees of uh, the investment advice world. And I joined an existing team with two other senior partners, uh, one of which was my father-in-law, and a fully business development role. And cold called businesses during the day and called homes in the evenings and went out to every networking event and hosted seminars just to try to start building a book of business. And a few years in, actually had the opportunity to help transition my, the most senior partner into retirement. And the five-person team that was formed eventually at Merrill Lynch was really the combination of, of that team and another team at the Merrill office at the time. Just really people that we felt we had a lot in common, a lot of idea sharing between the team, operational efficiencies when we joined forces, practice management initiatives like workflows and whatnot. Very horizontal at that point, so five partners plus five support staff. But, but really at that point, still operating as more of a bowling team than a basketball team, I would say it'd be a a good analogy for it. And I think that's it's somewhat common still in that structure to find pretty siloed advisors uh, within teams. So that would describe us. Yeah. So let's talk about you for one second as the youngest member of that team. So at that point, faced with either the opportunity to build a solo business or join a team, why was joining a team better for you? Yeah, that's a great question. And this was within my team as well as across advisors and, and, and various offices at Merrill Lynch found that I just gleaned a lot of knowledge and insight from having mentors around me, surrounding myself with people smarter than me to help me develop and help me serve clients better. So between that and going back to, again, the idea sharing, the operational efficiencies, I just saw a lot of value in, in being on a team at that point in my career. And what role did each member of the team play? So again, the bowling team versus basketball team, I think we were pretty siloed. We were really focused on managing the relationships that we had under our care. And I think we're working towards more of an ensemble approach, more of a having specializations within the team environment, but really did not get there by the time uh, 2019 rolled around, which is when I transitioned away from Merrill. So up until 2019, or before that, when you decided as a team to explore options. Up until that point, would you say it was a fully functioning, good team, solid team? I trusted my partners. We collaborated uh, very well. We got along very well. I think in the end, we just had the different goals and timelines that came into play in my transitioning away from the team approach. Mm -hmm. And do you think that had you not decided to explore as a group that you'd still be together today? In other words, if you had stayed at Merrill, would you still be together as a group? 
Yes. In fact, it was sad at the end to have the team break apart. There was just uh, so much camaraderie and and it was a, a fun environment within the team. So absolutely. Yeah. So tell me what was going on at Merrill at the time that led the team to explore other options. Was everyone on board that everyone wanted to explore? Was everyone in the same place? How did that work? Yeah, I don't want to put words in, in the mouths of my former partners, but I, the general sentiment was we felt there was that death by a thousand cuts, so to speak, the, the conflicts within the structure at the warehouse, the sense, at least that I was getting, that uh, a lot of the steps on the compliance side were to protect the firm versus protect the client or, or me as the advisor. You know, the compensation plan changes and just the sheer fact that compensation plan can be dozens of pages long and, and complicated. When really what I felt we should be focusing on is delivering excellent service and and advice to our clients. So as a team, what options were on the docket? As a team, what were the options you were considering? And I want to just be clear, when you began to explore, when you began the due diligence process, it wasn't going into it saying we're going to split. It was we're looking at options where we can all go together, correct? Correct. That was ideal. That was our ideal, was going as a team. The team, again, we're working towards this better foot running on all cylinders approach, team approach, and had uh, scale in terms of, of assets and client base, which provided some security. But we did go into it knowing that we had different ideas, and, and ultimately we could be going separate ways. And I think we were fine with that as long as we knew that we had vetted all options. And, you know, as you and your firm are well aware, Mindy, we certainly did vet all options. We went up and down the spectrum from anywhere from wirehouse to clearly do it yourself, build it from the ground up RIA. So let's talk about those options for a second. What were your feelings about the options you considered? You obviously ultimately wound up as a fee only RIA. Your partners did not. And your partners wound up at Morgan Stanley. So two completely opposite ends of the spectrum. And I guess the question that I'm asking is, we see this a lot where whether it be two teams coming together that are not now partners, but think that they want to work together and they begin to look at options and then can't come to an agreement. So one of three things happen. Either they stay put because they can't come to an agreement or they split as you did, or They go to a middle ground solution. And a lot of times firms like, let's say Raymond James, that allows you to join as part of the private client group, but probably a less bureaucratic organization than a Morgan or a Merrill, and eventually slide into independence can feel like a middle ground. So tell us a little bit about the options you considered as a team. And if considering middle ground flexible options to potentially stay together, if that was part of the conversation. It was. And candidly, we were very close to making a compromise, but I think in the end felt that we were each just compromising too much. We had different definitions, different priorities of those elements of change that come with the transition away from your existing firm. Again, not to put words in their mouth, but the partners that went to another wirehouse, I think they felt that their clients would be more comfortable within a similar structure. For me, maybe that would have been better, but it wasn't better enough. Mm. And this really ties back, at least on my end, to going down a rabbit hole for about six to nine months on the front end of our due diligence period to where I just could not get enough information about what this thing is out there uh, that is a fee on the RIA. I fell in love with the space. And made attempts and passes to convey that to my former partners. But again, different timelines, different goals, different priorities when it came to what we felt was best for clients. And do you think that age had anything to do with it? You as young with a long runway, them a little closer to perhaps the back nine of their careers, and certainly a move to Morgan Stanley allows them to be much more short-term focused, to monetize more in the short term. That's a really good question. I, I don't know. Well, first off, a lot of content that I would come across would, would pose the question, for example, well, why not go to a similar structure now and, and take some chips off the table or monetize and then transition to independence later if you have a long enough runway? 
And when I took a step back, first off, I wanted to always have a lens of how is this new structure or this move better for clients? And at the end of the day, is making two moves, in my mind, I couldn't answer that question affirmatively that it would be better for clients to do that. The other is, I think, honestly, fee-only RIA or this uh, similar fiduciary, 100% fiduciary structure is where the industry is going. I felt I was going where the puck uh, was going, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But yet, there was a lot you stood to lose by separating from the team. In fact, one of your partners actually chose to stay with Merrill and sign on to CTP, Merrill's Retire in Place program. And that actually meant you losing out on the ability to inherit his or her book of business. So how did you reconcile that? How did that feel? Well, a lot of the decisions around my moving from Merrill to RIA were through a very long-term lens. One component of going to a similar structure and signing on to a you know, transition package is you often sign away the next nine to 10 years of your career. And there are costs associated with that. There is no free lunch. If, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably just too good to be cheap. And I looked out in this independent space and said, if I'm running the PL and the clients are better served, I can make a very good living better than I am doing now. And it negates that, that enticement, so to speak, of taking on what's really a forgivable loan. So the longer the runway and the more control I had, I just saw the compounding effect of being a business owner. And now, and not just disregarding the fact that I forewent six figures worth of deferred compensation and the potential to receive a seven-figure transition bonus. However, again, in the long run, it was going to be better to invest in myself in the structure. Let's talk about that for a second. I think that term compounding effect is an important one. So one of the trends we've written about a lot and spoken about and seeing is that younger advisors are coming to independence much sooner than they might have. That one school of thought is you've got such a long runway, monetize now, jump from one traditional firm to another, take some significant chips off the table, and then nine or 10 years from now, you're still young enough to go independent. That really is what we saw for a very long time. But lately, for advisors that are confident in their growth and really all about the fiduciary model of being able to really definitively say, I'm doing what's in the best interest of clients, they are going to independence sooner and looking at this compounding effect of being a business owner over time. And what it means is, as you say, to forgo what would have been six-figure deferred comp and seven-figure transition bonus. So talk to me about that. That has to come with some anxiety, some, was there any crisis of faith about the growth and did I make a bad decision? And some sense of, boy, what that seven-figure transition package could mean for me. If you had asked me that two years ago, sure. There was some moments of, of am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I a moron by passing up this op what you potentially once in a lifetime opportunity? But since the transition, Mindy, not for a moment, not for a second. First off, the growth that we've experienced in our close to first two years of, of business, plus uh, what I see as the potential going forward, will eclipse that moment in time, point in time windfall. And this kind of ties into the advice that we give clients. There is an element of, hey, if you reduce your expenses and broaden the gap between what you're bringing into your household, the increased savings rate, you can hit that work optional lifestyle sooner, that compounding effect. You make sacrifices today for what is going to help you achieve your potential goal. And the other element I would actually add on to that, Mindy, is, is risk management. In the structure in the wirehouse, I always felt that if one guy or gal above me didn't like the way that I approached them or interacted with them or, or did business or, or interacted with clients, that was risking my career. And I think we're seeing examples of that. Now, as an independent, as a true owner of my book of business, I'd have to have 85 client families fire me for me to lose my job.
Well, what you're talking about is an increasing sense of vulnerability amongst wirehouse advisors. You've got a zero tolerance compliance policy and things that might have just been a warning or a slap on the wrist in the past has now become grounds for termination. And so you're watching a lot of people actually forced to the independent space and thrilled that they got there, but forced there because they were forced from their firms. So I think you're not wrong for what you saw. But let me ask you another question. So having represented you, I know that you were the ultimate DIYer, the ultimate do-it-yourselfer about building this firm. And in an industry landscape that's expanded, where there's been this whole ecosystem born to support the breakaway advisor, not the least of which are platform firms that offer anywhere from, say, 40 to 100% of trailing 12 months revenue, yet you still decided the DIY. So what jazzed you about building your own firm from the ground up? I can honestly say I did not realize how much of an entrepreneurial spirit I have until that due diligence period in 2019. I just, as you put it, got jazzed about every component, every facet, every element of building a business from the ground up. I wasn't intimidated by the prospect of having to run payroll or put printer ink in the printer or turn the lights on in the morning. The legal aspect of it in terms of business structure, the the compliance. What I wanted to do was get in to every aspect of building the firm so that I could learn as much as possible. And part of that is learning what I wanted to then outsource. I think there's this misconception inside of the wirehouse space about RIA and that you're out there on your own, alone. If you're DIY, it means you're on an island. That's not the case. There are very well-versed, very exceptional companies out there that'll help you do pretty much every aspect. And as you mentioned, that'll help you do every aspect of going independent. So so I wasn't afraid to, to get in there, do it all, learn what I wanted to, to keep in-house, learn what I wanted to outsource and so forth. So tell us a little bit, if you would, what are some of the components of the business you've built? I know Fidelity is custodian, so went into that decision. And how about some of the other fintech that you've pulled together as well? It has been so eye-opening to get out into the RA space and realize that how high the caliber is of offerings. No decision was taken lightly. And again, it took about six to nine months on the front end of due diligence to really kind of put each block together. The custodian with Fidelity, they've just been a fantastic partner for us. And what we were looking for, what I was looking for is a company that had the size and scale to offer that sense of stability and safety that clients look for. And Fidelity is, I believe, approaching $8 trillion of assets in our administration. They're by far the largest retirement plan provider in the country. They're a household name. So you have that brand recognition and it's a a high integrity, high caliber reputation. Many of the clients I interacted with were familiar with Fidelity and even had some experience with Fidelity, oftentimes, again, on that uh, workplace retirement plan side. But they're one of the largest custody providers for RIAs like our firm and had that size and scale and to have the safety and stability. The other component of that was they're privately held. So fidelity is not, and this is one thing I would convey to clients at the transition, is not beholden to that quarterly shareholder, public shareholder report that says, well, what have you done for me lately? What, how are you eking out a couple extra pennies from every client? And that's how they can turn around and reinvest profits into things like in my opinion, better technology, uh, very high level of cybersecurity capabilities, both online and so forth. So, And how about some of the fintech you've pulled together? Yeah, the technology, again, one of the biggest positives I've seen in the RA space is just how high the caliber of technology is. But I want to be candid. One thing that that I haven't found in the space is just a one-step solution. So when you say fintech, I'm thinking portfolio accounting, financial planning, CRM, risk assessment, right? All of those different elements that go into building out, you know, what I would call our dashboard or our workspace at Birch Creek. And so from a portfolio accounting standpoint, we went with a a relatively young up and comer in the space advise on, but it's really just been a fantastic uh, relationship for us. And that's where we would run 
for example, client reports that report their performance and allocation and, and holdings and realized gains and so forth for, for client reviews. Financial planning, e-money is often held as the gold standard in the industry. And we have found that it's just so robust in terms of how deep we can go with the planning elements. The risk assessment, risk allies is just really helpful in terms of proposals and comparing existing portfolios, maybe at another institution to how we would run money for clients in terms of how much risk they're taking. And that obviously will tie back into their financial plan. So these are technologies that have just leveled up how we work with clients. Mm -hmm. And is the fact that it's not all in one system, that what you just described is four different systems and then plus the custodian, is that problematic? I would not call it problematic. I would say it is, for lack of a better term, a downside. It's both a a pro and a con, right? So anything can be bolted on to the technology suite, the tech stack, as we call it, which is fantastic. However, it's all bolted on. And I think what we're seeing in the RIA space and the next evolution is more, again, of that dashboard approach. It's it's the one-step approach. But there's a cost to that in terms of the autonomy of which of these systems you want to use. Yeah. Well, the beauty of bolt-on is that you can fire one or bolt off something that's not working and replace it with something better, but it isn't quite as seamless. So you mentioned that ultimately you wanted to learn everything from the ground up so that ultimately you could decide what you were going to outsource. So what aspects do you eventually think you'll outsource? Well, it's interesting you ask that because I have outsourced, and, and we did out the gate using a compliance consultant, a lot of the compliance around the firm. But I actually, about a year in, had a, a former contact from Merrill Lynch approach me about potentially coming in and helping with compliance and operations of the firm. So I had the opportunity to hire a fantastic former administrative manager, so a compliance manager from Merrill Lynch to the firm, who is now our CCO, COO, uh, running compliance and operations. And that that was probably two to three years ahead of my originally intended schedule. But you know, when you have someone approach you that you know is going to look at other opportunities. If you don't jump on it, sometimes you have to jump on it. And he has been a great addition, added a ton of capacity for me in terms of running the business. And so that is not necessarily outsourcing, which was your question, but really delegating the compliance component, our relationship with the SEC. I think that's great. And look, a lot of times the best opportunities come not at the exact right time and you grab Mm -hmm. them and it sounds like you did. And that's great. I want to pivot to the break from Merrill, but Tell us a little bit about the size of the business you were running when you left Merrill and what it looks like now, two years later. So how much in assets, what did the client base look like and how about now? When I was with Merrill, I was managing around $150 million for clients. And about six months in to the transition, I was at $120 million. And so someone may say, well, that you only took 80%. Well, it really was a very intentional process of who I invited and pursued to join as a client. I felt at the time I was in the wirehouse, I was managing too many relationships. I think service can suffer really when you get above that 100, 125 number of, of client family households. So I was able to right size my practice at the time of the move. And granted, kind of back to the economics, not that this is the most important aspect, but they were all there. It wasn't a financial hit in terms of assets, maybe about 80%, but in terms of revenue, maybe 95. And since then it's grown. So we were at about 120 million. I was the only advisor going into March of 2020 through a number of, of referrals, both, in, and we can get into the details there, but from existing clients, but also a lot of estate planning and attorneys and CPAs that we work with, as well as bringing in a, a five-year RIA owner as a tuck-in to Birch Creek, who was very, very deep on the technology and planning side. We're up to about $184 million today. Got it. All right. Well, I do want to talk about that, the tuck-in, the acquisition of the five-year-old RIA. But let me first ask you, what do you think it is about Birch Creek that made these new referrals come to you as opposed to having come to you at Merrill? Or do you think that they would have? In most cases, they would not have. And this goes back to going to where I feel the, the puck is going in the industry. 
I believe consumers are beginning to learn what a fee-only fiduciary advisor really means. The professional contacts seem to already know it. One in five prospective clients understands really what a fiduciary and fee-only advisor is. I bet four in five professional contacts know. And so what I've found is contacts that might send me a referral here and there during my years at Merrill, we're now sending the majority of their referrals our way, not because I was utilizing, you know, commissionable or revenue sharing type of products in the past, but they know just based on the structure of Birch Creek that that client will never get into something that would be unnecessarily a liquid or, or high cost. And to that end, what are the kind of things you're able to do for clients now that you couldn't do at Merrill? I'd like to turn that question around just a little bit and say, is there anything that we can't do? Which the answer would be no. I think, again, back to the misconception of the RIA space, it's always, well, I'd have to give up my securities-based lending, or I'd have to give up the banking features, or I'd have to give up this. I'd have to get... It's all out here in the RIA space and available, and, and in a lot of cases, more competitive. So I didn't feel that I was giving anything up. What we can do is really put transparency around the relationship. And I'd like to go into that a little bit. So in the wirehouse structure, I was always using this multiple hats analogy. Well, on your IRA, Mr. Client, I'm wearing my fiduciary hat, but on, on your brokerage account, I'm wearing my suitability hat. And, and we don't have any proprietary you know, investment products, but oh, your daughter needs a, a mortgage for a first time home purchase. Well, I've got to show you this proprietary mortgage. All of that is out the window. We have arm's length between us and our custodian, our primary custodian, I should say, and we're not beholden to utilizing that custodian. We can go to any custodian, really. And uh, the same with product base, the same with the research that we tap into. And so really, again, it lifts these restrictions off of what we can bring to clients in terms of advice. So we talked about referrals. How did your clients respond to your message, I'm leaving Merrill Lynch and forming my own firm? Overwhelmingly positive. In fact, there were some surprises, some relationships that maybe I didn't feel I had as tight a relationship with that were, say, on my maybe list instead of my yes list, right, that you always make before you make a move like this, that fully embraced the move because, in a lot of cases, they were business owners themselves. Mm. And I think that investment in myself, investment in confidence uh, in myself, it resonated with those business owner clients. Yeah. One of the things we hear sometimes is that it takes about 300 million in assets to begin to really get scale where the economies of scale kick in and it makes sense to be a business firm owner. And you were at half that and actually less than half that six months out. Would you agree with that comment? What's your feeling about what it takes, how much under management? Because if you're speaking to others like you, long advisors that want the compounding effect, young advisors want the compounding effect of having a long runway, I wonder what you'd say to them. I think that is 100% a misconception. I was speaking to a consultant at one point in the due diligence process that we were talking about the expenses that go into running a firm. I'm trying to obviously back out, okay, what's the net income? What's the quote unquote payout ratio? And they said to me, well, Dan, you can run this with a 98% payout rate if you do it in your basement with your dog as your assistant. Mm -hmm. And I found that really interesting. There are RIAs that start from scratch, calling from day one for client one. And I don't think that you have the capabilities and, and expertise, having an established base of clients to, to get you off the ground. But I don't think that there's necessarily a, a minimum. Obviously, you're a business owner. You're running the PL for better or worse. You have to manage expenses relative to your revenue. However, I would encourage advisors to, to invest in themselves. And honestly, if there were a Birch Creek that I felt was a, a perfect fit for me when I was looking at tr transitioning, I would have highly considered a tuck-in. I don't think I'm the average advisor who doesn't mind getting down in the dirt and building this thing from the ground up. I think most advisors just want to get into a better structure in a lot of cases and serve their clients, be client-facing. 
So I think if if there were a Birch Creek available to me to tap into at the time I left, I would have strongly considered it. But in my due diligence, it just wasn't the high scale national service providers that I was finding as an option. Long winded answer, but I hope that addressed your your question. Totally. And was your team with you? Actually, two questions. One was, the, did the team see it the same way about going fully independent? And how did your team decide whether to go to Team Morgan Stanley or Team Birch Creek? It's a great question. I think it goes back to the different priorities and, and different perspective on the risks, feeling that your client would be more comfortable in a similar structure. And it was a change. I think I realized that this was a change for the better for my clients and the other advisors didn't see it that way. And I think that there would have been a lot of good that came from the scale, but we're also, we're a small firm currently relative and very nimble and able to grow in the right way and really focus on, on fit, building out an ensemble team out the gate as opposed to working towards that. Got it. And how scary was it to leave the familiarity and comfort of Mother Merrill? As much as things were changing and it was feeling more bureaucratic and you were more entrepreneurial than you thought you were, it had to feel a little bit scary to separate from your team and leave what had been familiar for so long. There was an element of that, but by the time the day arrived that I resigned, Mindy, it was an overwhelming sense of relief. And although I've never, and I've worked very hard in my career, but I have never worked as hard as those uh, you know, following weeks uh, from resigning and, and, and beginning to, to call and invite clients to come. A lot of work goes in that, but it was also a lot of fun and it was reaffirming. Back to having transition portion of my book from a retiring advisor, I always wondered if there was just the, in the back of my mind, if there was just inertia keeping those clients on the books or if they were really finding you know, a ton of value in the advice they were provided, which is probably just me being a little oversensitive. But now having transitioned and again, right-sizing, I know that these clients have made a huge bit of confidence in me and the advice that they're being provided. That, I think, was the, the basis of that sense of relief, that transition. Yeah. So what's your vision for the firm? In other words, $184 million today, where do you think it gets to? Tell us about what you think the growth trajectory is and how you'll get there. The unplanned opportunity for growth that I, that I really wasn't considering at the time of transition because I was just so focused on you know, getting my clients over and situated was was growth through acquisition, uh, potentially retiring advisors, whether in the independent space or otherwise, and then tucking in those next teammates to build out the, the Birch Creek team. So I just am so excited. I think if, and one reason I'm doing this podcast with you, this conversation with you today, Mindy, is just if there's another Dan or Danielle Johnson out there who is hemming and hawing and certainly understandably concerned about, well, what's my next step? Should I have a next step? I, I want them to know that this space is, in my opinion, the best structure for clients. And I think once that story is told, advisors will come, Birch Creek will scale. And that scale, to bring it to a second point, I think can offer clients an unparalleled experience in terms of really almost a family office type of approach for our typical client, which is really the millionaire next door, mm -hmm. right? The unassuming couple that saved a couple million dollars and now they're transitioning to retirement and they're looking to replace that paycheck. Yeah. Scale in an RIA firm can bring in house tax services, estate planning. I have a mentor up in Chicago, firms a little bit bigger. They have a, a associate just focused on Medicare and social security planning for their clients. These are some really cool things that we can get into with clients as we scale. So, so you asked about the future plans for Birch Creek, and I do see growing. I shortly after my transition took a step back and said, what do I want to do here? Do I want to sit back on my haunches and coast and just give clients a great experience? How will I feel about that 10 years down the road looking back? Or do I want to really pursue growing and scaling this firm and making Birch Creek something really special? And I chose the latter direction. As you think about the future and the end game, and I realize that's a long time away because you're young, but as you think about the future, what do you imagine? 
Do you imagine selling to a private equity firm, to a larger RAA? Do you imagine selling it internally? Do you imagine never selling it? What do you think that looks like? It's a great question. I'll start by saying when I was in the wirehouse structure, I spent probably more time than I should have doing my own family's financial planning in terms of when is that day going to come that I have a work optional lifestyle and I can transition to my next chapter. Now that I am in the independent fee-only RA space, that is such a distant thought for me. I am so excited about the next three decades of my career, seeing clients through their retirement plan, seeing the transition of their wealth onto the next generation, that I really don't put a lot of thought into stuff. It's more fun. It's enjoyable. I get to continue to nerd out on all those financial planning topics that, <laughs> I, that I love to dive into. And I have three young daughters. Hopefully one day they have one or maybe all three of them have interest in coming into the business. But you know, even more so than that, in terms of legacy, I would love to be able to sell the firm to the employees of the firm down the mm. road. And whether it's an ESOP structure or something similar, the enterprise value of Birch Creek is not the revenue generated by my you know, clients that I'm primary advisor on or the other advisors here. The enterprise value is the team, it's the processes, it's the brand. Those are what builds uh, in, in that value building is attributable to all the employees, not just Dan Johnson. Dan, I'm excited for you. And I am so in such admiration of your sense of entrepreneurial spirit, your belief in yourself, your courageous decision to separate from your team and leave Merrill and build it all yourself. So if you were to share one word of advice with your ex wirehouse colleagues about exploration, about life beyond Merrill or the wirehouse world, about being independent, about anything, what would you say it would be? Early in my due diligence process, a, a friend who had left Merrill and gone independent about a year earlier said, Dan, you really need to take a look at this fee only structure. And at the time I said, there, well, there's no way, 20% of my revenue is transactional. I just can't imagine putting my Series 7 in, in the closet and having it go away after how hard I worked all those nights at Tigre Price to get it so many years ago. But at the end of the day, it's really just opened so many doors. And there was not a situation when I really took a step back and looked hard for a client who had been engaging on a transactional basis to transition to fee only. You can charge them a flat rate rather than markup on bonds or commissions on stocks and, and have it eliminate a major conflict of interest in the relationship. Whether you're directly or not influenced by that conflict of interest, I think the fee only space is a little understood by advisors on the other end of the spectrum and deserves a really good hard look. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And you're right. When you live in the traditional brokerage world, it doesn't really, you could be 99% fee-based, but it doesn't hurt you to have 1% transactional business in the just-in-case or accommodative stance. But what you're talking about is when you go independent, there's a real benefit, even if it means losing some relationships or losing some revenue to going fee-only. And I think what was surprising is, how little impact it had. Again, I think we found ways to transition transactional relationships in a win-win situation for each of those clients. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, Dan, you've built something special. I think it's exciting two years out. We wish you nothing but all the best and can't wait to hear more and watch you grow. And I'm hoping you'll come back again. Thank you so much, Mindy. I would love to do it. Pleasure. While it meant each member of his team choosing a different path, Dan shared those paths were the right ones for each of them and their clients. Yet it was his realization about independence that really resonated, that ultimately, as he put it, the growth potential will eclipse the moment in time windfall of taking a recruitment deal. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the articles link to browse recent topics. 
These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached by cell at 973-476-8578 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And keep in mind that our services are available without cost to the advisor. Please see our website for more information. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And if you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, I'd be grateful if you gave it a store rating and a review. That will let other advisors know if it's a show worth their time to listen to. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.